in Australia, there is a state-funded radio and television service called SBS. SBS stands for Special Broadcast Service and is directed to Australia's various immigrant communities. It runs news programs from foreign sources, foreign language films, etc. Special Broadcast Service is not a particularly catchy name. Two or three years ago, under the three-letter acronym SBS, the legend began to appear on the television screen, six billion stories and counting. And then a few months ago, the legend changed, seven billion stories and counting. <laughs> and the implication is clear. Each human being in this world of art has a story, and the task of a service like SBS is to tell these stories or as many as it can. In the lexicon of the Anglo-West, the words story and narrative have taken on new prestige of late. Politicians and corporations no longer speak of, speak of presenting a case, but of presenting a narrative. The connotations of disreputability or even falsehood that used to cling to the word story, have you been telling stories again? Tommy, have evaporated or been finessed. Truth, who knows what that is, say the new storytellers. In the meantime, we have stories, some of them more powerful than others, more persuasive. In this new world of stories, scientists are having a hard time. The cure of the science, the harder the time. A man sitting in a room drinking cups of coffee, thinking, taking naps, coming out after two weeks with a sheet of paper covered in symbols which his colleagues at Pine represent an advance in algebraic topology. That is not much of a story. And if the man emerges from the ordeal of pure thought, shaking his head, his paper blank, that is not a story at all. Scientists at the other end of the spectrum, the impure end, have better prospects. You're a, <coughs> you are a marine biologist. You don your diving suit and plunge into tropical waters. The support crew in the boat wait nervously. They check the telemetry, having been attacked by a shark, by a giant cuttlefish. Then at last your head pops up. They heave a sigh of relief and exchange high fives. It is a story, a recognizable little story beginning, middle, and end, part of a larger story of a life of exploration and discovery. The purer end of science remains wedded to a conception of the truth that sits uncomfortably in this new world of stories. We have our little stock of scientific anecdotes, young Isaac Newton wondering why the apple falls, kindly Professor Kekulé seeing the structure of the benzene molecule in the dream. Yet there remains a fundamental difference between talking of Newton's theory of gravitation and talking of Shakespeare's Hamlet. The play Hamlet is forever tied to the intentions of its author, whereas to the extent that it is true, that is, universally accepted, the formula describing gravitation has broken its ties with the man who first, first wrote it down. It has become just part of the way things are. The truths I'm talking about here used to be called objective truths, though the, team, the term seems to have fallen into disuetude. The objective truths in which science trades sit uneasily among truths that are relative to the subject, my truth or your truth, in a world of seven billion stories or the good. In the capacious world of stories, there is room for the story classical mecha mechanics tells, but room too for other stories of how the celestial bodies move, for example, the story of an unmoved mover. But are there in there seven billion stories? Even if we concede that one has to be human to tell a story, does one have to be human to have a story? Don't Dogs and cats and mice and frogs have stories too. And what of microbes, what of bushes and trees? Aren't there in fact trillions of billions of stories? 
there are philosophers who distinguish between beings that can be said to be the subject of a life and beings whose lives are determined from birth to death. Barnacles, for example, are living beings that are not the subjects of lives. There is only one barnacle life, the same from one barnacle to the next. On the other hand, a dog's life may, to a degree, be unique, or at least may be felt by the individual dog to be unique. Similarly, no matter how closely the life of one Bangladeshi rice farmer may, from the outside, resemble the life of another Bangladeshi rice farmer, each life is felt by its subject to be uniquely his own. This claim, granted, amounts to less than saying that each of us, man and dog, is master of our story, master of our fate. But it amounts to more than saying that in all cases, save for a minority of highly reflective human beings, we are born into a life which we then blindly live out. It is the space between these two positions being master of a life, being the vehicle of a life, that I'm touching on here. And my first question then is, what is it to have a life? Is there a difference between saying every dog has a, a, a life and saying every human being has a life? My second question, what is the difference in the case of human beings between having a life and having a life story. In particular, what cultural assumptions might I be making when I say, I have a life story and it is my own? I ask this latter question because among the seven billion of us, there are some who see it as no source of pride or self-validation to be told that their life stories are unique different from those of their neighbors. I live in society, such people might reply. My life is just a typical life. During the 19th century, a kind of fiction flourished in Europe that was, in retrospect, given the name realism. To theorists of the realist novel, novels like that of those of uh, Balzac and Tolstoy and Zola, a key concept is representativity or typicality. Character, I'm concentrating on character now, though much the same can be argued in respect of action, needs to be both representative, typical, and unique. In the best realist novels, characters manage to be historically representative, ideally representative deep historical currents, yet are not trapped by their representativeness, their typicality, in some sort of social allegory. They're not, for example, just a typical workman struggling for justice against a typical factory owner. They are individual, they exercise individual freedom. Behind the SBS formula, we can detect a primitive version of the same conception of realism, that our seven billion stories should at the same time be representative, tell us what it is like to be a Bangladeshi rice farmer or a Moldovan sex worker, and unique, the story of one particular man, one particular woman. For, the theory goes, the stories of others become meaningful to us, relevant to us, by a process of sympathetic identification. It is not with the farmer as farmer or the sex worker as sex worker that we identify. It is with the underlying man or woman, the being with whom we share humanity. If we identify with a stranger, then his story, her story becomes our story.
Thus far, I've been talking about life stories and the generality or uniqueness or, uniqueness or generality and uniqueness of life stories. I now turn to the question of truth and ask, are our life stories ours to compose? Nancy is 33 years old. She is divorced. She has a nine-year-old daughter who lives with her. The father has remarried and emigrated to Canada. She works in a travel agency. Earlier, she worked in a furniture store in the bookkeeping department. She doesn't like her present job. She had wanted to go to art school, but her parents wouldn't let her. Now it is too late. Nancy goes through a black phase. She finds herself eating compulsively. She cries herself to sleep at night. On the advice of a friend, she sees a therapist. She is encouraged to talk about her childhood. Gradually, a story begins to take form out of the mists of the past. The story of a mother, Nancy's mother, bitter about being trapped in the life of a suburban housewife, envious of her daughter, her daughter's looks, her daughter's talents, her daughter's freedom, and determined that her daughter shall suffer as she has suffered. It was her mother, Nancy discovers in the course of therapy, not her father, as she had previously believed, who was responsible for the decision that she should go to a secretarial school, not art school. Nancy's therapist encourages her to face up to her newfound life story and to use the self-awareness she has gained to free herself from the mother figure inside her, the mother who does not want her to succeed. Nancy re-enters the world armed with a new self-understanding. She feels stronger and more confident. She enrolls for evening classes and discovers she has talents as a potter. She sells some pieces. She has her first exhibition. Her young daughter, who had been having a hard time at school, begins to come out of her shell. The reawakening of Nancy can almost certainly be attributed to her happy decision to see a therapist. Her therapist has enabled her to see the shape of her life, to tell her life story, which up to this point has been a repeat of her mother's story of defeat, but which she is now going to transform into a different story story of success. By understanding the past, Nancy has been enabled and empowered to escape the past. She understands the past by seeing the shape of the past, that is, by seeing it not as just one thing after another, but as a story with a shape to it. We call on Nancy's therapist and discuss the case with her. R.D. Arturin Partem, we suggest. Wouldn't it be prudent to ask Nancy's mother whether it is true that she was, she was envious of her daughter's looks and talents and prevented her from going to art school? That is not the way therapy works. <laughs> a therapist's consulting room is not a court of law. It is not up to me as therapist to pass judgment on Nancy or her mother. Nancy is my patient, my client, therefore it is Nancy's story that is before us, not her mother's. Can't you see the change that has taken place in Nancy since she began therapy? Nancy is a new person. Nancy may indeed be a new person, we reply, but what if she is a new person on the basis of a falsehood? What if Nancy's mother is actually a nice woman who never wanted anything but the best for her daughter? I don't want to get bogged down in some philosophical discussion about truth and falsehood, replies the therapist. What matters is subjective truth, truth for the self. The truth for Nancy is that her mother tried to reproduce her own failed life in her daughter. Now that Nancy has recognized that, she's been able to liberate herself from the dead hand of the past, to liberate not only herself, but her young daughter too. If Nancy's truth is good enough for her, it's good enough for me, and should be good enough for you too.
Second question, the question which I end, if we are going to be authors of our own life stories, are we free to be authors of their truth as well? Thank you.